Hello everyone, and welcome back to Political Science 1513 American Federal Government Online. In the first half of this week's lecture, we discussed, among other things, the core principles of our Constitution. Well now, in this video, we're going to focus in on one of those seven core principles, that of federalism. But let's start with another overview. Today, we're going to cover each of the following points. What is federalism? What are its main alternatives? And how are they distinct? Well, what are their relative pros and cons? What does the Constitution say about how to resolve conflicts between laws passed at different levels of government? And how has federalism in the United States changed or evolved over time? I'll go ahead and give you a hint right here. There are two major historical trends you're going to want to pay attention to. Uh, finally, what are the main types of power created by our Constitution and our constitutional system of federalism? Okay. To get started, do recall that we introduced the concept of federalism in general terms during the first half of this week's lecture. But as it happens, this particular concept is a bit too nuanced to adequately cover in a general discussion of the Constitution as a whole. So again, in this video, we're going to try to break the concept down a little bit more thoroughly. Basically, again, federalism is just a system of governance in which lawmaking authority is organized, divided, and shared across multiple different levels of government. Remember, though, that the idea of federalism should not be confused with the concept of separated powers. Federalism tells us how to divide, share, and organize powers across different levels of government. Levels of government can be distinguished from one another by their degree of locality. The government of the city of Durant, for example, is very local. It only has jurisdiction over a very small area. So we say that it is a low level of government. The United States federal government, on the other hand, is national. It has authority all the way across the country. So it's not local at all, and we say that this is a high level of government. You can contrast this with the separation of powers, which describes not how powers are going to be shared or divided across different levels of government, but how powers should be divided across different branches of government that all operate at the same level or degree of locality. So, for example, in the United States federal government, we have three branches. The legislative branch, which creates the laws, the executive branch, which executes and enforces the laws, and of course, the judicial branch, uh, which resolves disputes about the law. The chief difference between these three branches is not their level of locality, but rather their function. Each fulfills a different function, but all three exist at the national level, and each one is going to see to its own duty for the entire country. So let's explore this a little bit further using a map to try and help illustrate the idea. Right? Again, federalism is a system for dividing, organizing, and sharing power across multiple different governments that exist at many different levels of locality. Each of these governments has some degree of lawmaking authority within its own jurisdiction. For example, the government of Oklahoma exists at the state level. It can make and enforce rules that people in the state of Oklahoma have to follow. So if you live here, you'll have to follow the laws of Oklahoma. Conversely, if you happen to live in Texas, you don't have to follow the laws of Oklahoma at all. But we both have to follow the laws of the United States because it has authority at the national level. So each of us is living under one set of shared national laws and a separate set of laws passed by our respective states. Similarly, we are each going to follow the laws of our own cities and our own counties. I live in Durant, Oklahoma, so I follow the rules of Durant. I do not live or abide in the city of McAllister, so I don't have to follow the laws of McAllister. But whether you live in OKC, Durant, or McAllister, you do follow the laws of Oklahoma, and you also have to follow the laws of the United States as a whole. 
To make sense of this, it is, I think, helpful to compare our federal system of governance to the main alternatives. So what I would like for you to do at this point is to stop and try to imagine a system of government in which we did not share or divide power across multiple different levels of government, in which all of the lawmaking authority, all of the policymaking power and functions of government were handled at the same level of locality. What would this look like? Well, there are two different possibilities that we're going to talk about. The most obvious option is to have a unitary government. And this was the standard type of government uh, for a very long time, certainly at the time that our country was created. And it is still used today in places like uh, France or in China, for example. But basically, in a unitary government, virtually all of the lawmaking authority and powers of government are going to be concentrated at the national level. You might still have some state and local governments, but their job is to simply carry out or implement the decisions and policies made at the national level by the country's central government. So as a result, in a unitary country, there will only be one body of laws. And these laws are going to apply equally to everybody in the entire country, regardless of what state or city or district any of these particular people happen to live at a given point in time. Another possibility is a confederal government in which virtually all of the lawmaking authority and powers of government are concentrated at the state level. In a confederacy, you'll have a number of sovereign states, each of which has ultimate authority within its own boundaries. But these states essentially get together and form a weak type of federal government to sort of help them coordinate team efforts and work towards shared goals or, for example, protect themselves from a common enemy. Basically, each state usually will send a certain number of delegates to represent that state in this newly formed national government. Those delegates will then get together, discuss what course of action is in everyone's best interest, and then send their recommendations back to the individual states. And theoretically, the states will follow these recommendations and how they exercise their own authority, but they don't necessarily have to. So, for example, if the National Congress of a Confederacy says, we all need to create a new tax to fund our military and protect ourselves from British incursion, uh, the states will, generally speaking, comply with that because they've recognized that it's in their own best interest. But they don't have to do so. The national government is, generally speaking, kind of an advisory council. It has very little, if any, real lawmaking authority. And where it does have authority, that authority is delegated to it by the states that it is trying to exert influence on. So what this means is that, by and large, in a confederal system, each of us lives under the laws of our own state, but we don't really have any significant shared or national policies that everybody in the entire country has to follow simultaneously. Now, the states, again, might still get together and create similar policies, right? Uh, this was sometimes the system of government that we tested out under the Articles of Confederation, for example, and basically all of the states agreed that they were going to work together to fight against the British. But, right, uh, the existence of the Confederacy, as we saw, did run into some trouble at that time. Now, to be clear, the Confederacy is not necessarily an obsolete system of government. In fact, we see some forms of supranational Confederacies emerging today. Uh, a modern example of what a Confederacy might look like would be the European Union. But one way or the other, uh, the chief difference between a unitary government like what we see in China and the confederal government that we observed in the United States under the Articles of Confederation has to do with where power is concentrated. In a unitary system, 
lawmaking authority, government power is going to be concentrated in a single central national government. In a confederal system, it's going to be concentrated in several different state governments which only have the ability to exert influence or exercise power and lawmaking authority within their own respective boundaries. And you can think of federalism as a sort of middle ground between these two extremes, somewhere between a unitary and a confederal government. And that makes sense if you consider the historical context that federalism is going to emerge out of. Remember, prior to the revolution, most Americans had some experience with strong centralized governments running their country as a unified territory in Europe. And what they found was that while the centralization of authority was sometimes helpful, it did make it easier to organize and mobilize people towards common goals, it also tended to make the federal government too strong and less responsive to the localized particular wants, needs, and interests of specific groups or regions within the broader country. Uh, imagine if we had this today, for example. Imagine that we were using a unitary system in the United States today. Well, that would mean that people in rural states like Oklahoma would have to live under the same set of economic policies as people from big urban states like California. And that would be problematic for us because people in large urban states like California and people in small rural states like Oklahoma are going to expect and need and require and demand very, very different types of things from their government. The economic wants, needs, and interests of California are very, very different than the economic wants, needs, and interests of Oklahoma. And yet, in a unitary system, we would have to have one body of economic policies that both of these uh, specific states are going to have to try and follow together. Okay, uh, So as a result, right, what we're going to find is that by the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, uh, War we had run from one extreme to the other. Right? During this time, we shied away from those strong, centralized, unresponsive, unitary governments and created a confederation, which, by concentrating power in the hands of local state-level governments instead of the federal central government, local state-level governments made sure that our leaders would be more responsive uh, and more able to adapt to the unique wants and needs of particular regions. At the same time, because these state governments were smaller and more local, uh, they tended to be weaker and easier, uh, easier to control, as well as more responsive to the people than what you would expect to observe in a federal or centralized government that has to try and satisfy the entire country simultaneously with its policies. But if you've kept up with your reading, uh, you'll know at this point that this confederal system is going to have its own set of problems, in particular uh, after the American Revolution. In this case, what we're going to find is that we had the opposite problem. The unitary system created a federal government which was too strong for our liking, but the confederal system created a federal government that was too weak for our liking. It couldn't level taxes without the permission of the states, for example. It couldn't regulate interstate commerce or manage countrywide issues like national security because it didn't really have very much authority. So when they drafted the Constitution, our framers shrewdly met in the middle of their experiences with these two extremes. Instead of putting all of the power in the hands of a single centralized federal government like they had seen in the unitary systems of Europe, or into the hands of several independent state governments like they had seen under the Articles of Confederation, they decided to share and divide this power across multiple levels so that it was never concentrated at any one degree of locality. Now, the advantage to this is that we kind of get the best of both worlds. Uh, 
we get small and locally representative governments that can respond to our own unique wants, needs, and interests. People in Oklahoma don't have to live under the same economic policies and people in California and vice versa. Each state can now use its own government authority to address its own set of peculiar wants, needs, interests, and issues. Well, at the same time, though, because we do still have a relatively strong federal government, we are nevertheless able to work together when facing a common crisis that requires cohesion and teamwork. If some country decided to invade us, for example, it wouldn't be every state for itself, each raising its own militia and then hopefully coordinating their military actions. No, 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 no. It would be a single concentrated fight of the United States as a whole versus this foreign aggressor. aggressor. So those national issues can be handled by a strong federal government, whereas local issues can be addressed by state governments. But the flip side, the sort of cons attached to the federal system, is that it can be very, very complex and confusing for the citizens. Because now what we have are many different governments, each of which is creating its own set of laws. And many of these laws are going to overlap with one another, while others are going to be exclusive to a particular place. For example, Imagine that I asked you, what is the minimum drinking age for the United States? You might be tempted to answer 21, uh, but that's not technically correct. Technically, we don't have a national drinking age in the United States. Instead, we have 51 separate state level drinking ages passed individually by each state and Washington DC. Now, every single one of these states has chosen to exercise its authority over the drinking age within its own territory by setting that particular age to 21 in exchange for funds from the federal government. But they don't have to. They could reject the funds that the federal government has offered and lower that drinking age to 18 if they chose to do so. They have the authority in our system of government. Uh, or what if, what if you had a friend from a unitary country like France who had no experience with federalism, who didn't really understand how that worked or operated, and this person wanted to know whether marijuana was actually legal in the United States? Well, if you asked him or her, is it legal in France, that person could just say no. Right? But in our case, in our case, uh, the legal status of marijuana is a little bit more ambiguous, a little bit more complicated. You're going to have to provide a bit more contextualization and explanation just to make sense of what the laws actually say. Because technically, yeah, there are still federal laws against the use of marijuana in the United States. But many states, like Colorado, have begun to decriminalize marijuana at the state level. and this is complicated, okay? It makes it difficult for us to know what is and is not allowed of us because we're all going to have to follow a number of different and sometimes conflicting policies. If I'm in California, I as a city might want to respect federal immigration laws, but because of California's policies on sanctuary cities, in order to follow federal law, I would have to violate state law. On the other hand, if I wanted to follow the California policy, I would have to violate the federal law. And both of these have authority over me. So again, it's creating a lot of confusion. Now, this also helps to tie into another point, another issue uh, that is going to be worth substantial discussion, right? Because again, in federalism, we wind up having a whole bunch of different governments, the government of Durant, the government of McAllister, the government of Oklahoma, the government of Texas, the governments of the other 48 states of Washington, D.C., and of the federal government, right? All operating at different levels. And if we have multiple different governments operating at different and sometimes overlapping realms, what happens when a law passed by one of these governments at one level of locality conflicts with that of another 
law passed by a different, maybe higher level of government? Well, to answer this, we need to look back to the Constitution. More specifically, we need to look at what is called the Supremacy Clause in Article 6, which reads, and I quote, This Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or the laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. Okay, uh, Let's try and break that down a little bit. The Constitution and acts of Congress and treaties are all going to be laws of the United States. These are sources of federal policy. And here we find that the Constitution is telling us that federal laws are supreme over state laws, that all states are bound thereby, bound by federal laws, regardless of what their own constitutions and laws happen to say. So technically, Colorado doesn't have the constitutional authority to legalize marijuana. California doesn't have the constitutional authority to create sanctuary cities. And those actions are verifiably unconstitutional at this time. Because what this supremacy clause ultimately does is establish what is known as the hierarchy of laws. The hierarchy of laws is a concept that we use to help us figure out what to do when laws passed by different levels of the government conflict with one another. And basically, again, what it tells us is that the Constitution takes precedent of everything, followed by federal laws that are passed consistent with the Constitution, then state constitutions, and then state laws, all the way down to city and county ordinances. So if any law passed by any level of government conflicts with something in a higher level on this diagram, uh, or in reality in the sense that it is less local, then that law will be overturned. For example, Congress cannot make a law, Congress cannot make a law that violates the United States Constitution. Colorado, right, Colorado, cannot make a law or include in its constitution a policy that violates an act of Congress. Now again, this isn't how things always work in practice. We see right now that in Colorado, that particular state is violating federal law. We see that California is violating federal law. Some states and cities are all across the country violating federal policies on marijuana and on immigration. But doing so is technically unconstitutional. And what the Supremacy Clause tells us is that the federal government is supposed to be enforcing its decisions against these states that are attempting to ignore the laws of the land. Yet again, that's how things work in a constitutionally perfect system. Not necessarily in reality. Not everything the government does is actually going to be consistent with the hierarchy of laws, with what our Constitution has to tell us. And this is true whether we're looking at the Supremacy Clause or any other part of the United States Constitution. Okay. All right, so that's already covered quite a bit of content, but we're going to move right along, and we're going to start to talk about the different types of federalism. Because I've told you, federalism is a system for sharing and dividing authority between levels of government. But throughout our nation's history, there have been different types of federalism, or in other words, we've divided and shared power across levels of government in a couple of different ways. So let's start with the first and most strictly constitutional form of federalism. This is what we call dual federalism. And it was the system originally envisioned by the framers when they wrote our constitution. Your textbook defines the term dual federalism as follows, and I quote, a model of federalism 
in which the states and the national government each remain supreme within their own spheres. This doctrine looks on nation and state as co-equal sovereign powers, end quote. In other words, in dual federalism, government power is strictly divided between the states and the federal government with very little overlap in the jurisdiction of each. Neither the state nor the federal government has supremacy over the other. Instead, each one is considered co-equal. Each one is simply going to handle a different type or set of issues. Under the 10th Amendment of the United States Constitution, the federal government's powers were, at least in theory, limited to those specifically given to it by the Constitution, which means that for the first 150 or so years in our nation's history, under the system of dual federalism, the federal government handled internal improvements, tariffs, patents, uh, money, coining currency, uh, foreign policy, and the military. And the states had no authority in any of these areas. But everything else, everything that wasn't in that short list I just detailed, was reserved to the states. So the states got to govern property, they got to govern health, they got to cover, uh, govern safety, morals, education, criminal law, elections. Basically, in a strictly constitutional version of federalism, anything not specifically delegated to the federal government by the Constitution itself is reserved to the states. But that's not the reality of the government in the United States today. Theoretically, the federal government should not have jurisdiction, for example, to pass health care reform laws. Right? There's nothing in the Constitution talking about health care, so under the Tenth Amendment, that ought to be an issue handled strictly by the states. But in practice, what we've recently seen is that well, the federal government has gone ahead and done so anyway, and it seems intent on continuing to do so. Okay? And that's because one of the two major trends in the development of uh, American federalism that I want you to know about has been a continual shift from dual federalism towards what we call cooperative federalism. Cooperative federalism may be defined as a model of federalism in which states and the national government cooperate in solving the same sets of problems. In this system, governments at all different levels are going to work as a team to solve common issues. But again, when you've got the state and federal governments both making laws on the same set of issues, you open up the door be, uh, for some form of conflict between those laws. So it's important to note that while there are different levels of government acting as a team in a system of cooperative federalism, the federal government is the captain of this team. In this system, states are subordinate to the federal government, and federal powers are going to be systematically more expansive. Contrary to what was originally expected, states have become largely subsidiary, largely subordinate to the ever-expanding powers of our federal government. Right? As they did, their powers also became increasingly mixed with those of the federal government so that it is no longer clear where state power ends and federal power begins or vice versa. Your textbook provides a helpful metaphor to help make sense of the differences between cooperative or marble cake and dual or layer cake federalism. So first on the left we're going to see a marble cake. Uh, the marble cake, again, is meant to parallel our current system of cooperative federalism. And we've used this marble cake federalism since around the time of FDR. Now, remember from your previous history classes, when FDR became president, our country was facing a couple of really big nationally relevant issues. We had the Great Depression, World War II, uh, so on and so forth. And in order to address these problems to his satisfaction, FDR needed more power. So what he did 
at that time was begin to inject the federal government into areas that had previously been the domain of the states, into areas which, under the 10th Amendment, the federal government theoretically ought not be involved. So, in the marble cake, we can see the same thing happening with our icing and our breading. If the icing is federal power and the breading is state power, you can see they've become interwoven. The icing is actually mixed into the bread so that it's no, uh, no longer clear where one begins and the other ends. You don't necessarily know where the federal government has authority and where the states have authority because most of the time both of them are going to have some role to play and each is going to cooperate with the other to address whatever issue happens to be facing them at that particular time. Okay. Now this is in stark contrast with that original more constitutional model of layer cake or dual federalism. If you look at the image on the right you will see that in a layer cake in a layer cake, there's a clear delineation between the authority and the programs and policies among different levels of government. At the top, we'll have a layer of federal issues. Then we'll have a layer of issues handled by the states. Then a layer of issues handled by the counties, and so on all the way down to the very most local governments. And there's very little, if any, overlap between these different layers of government power you can clearly see where one layer or realm of policymaking begins and the other ends. So these are the two main types of federalism that we have seen throughout our nation's history. And I do want you to know that we have transitioned from an early, strictly constitutional model of layer cake or dual federalism to a modern, less strictly constitutional system of cooperative federalism in which the federal government has taken over and injected itself into parts of public life that should, constitutionally speaking, be reserved to the states. And that's not a bad segue into the next component of our lecture on federalism. Under the Constitution of the United States, there are many types of power allotted to different governments. First, we have federal powers. Those are going to be given to the federal, national, central government. And these can be either enumerated or implied. Enumerated powers are sometimes called delegated powers because they are explicitly enumerated in the Constitution and delegated specifically to the federal government. And originally, these were the only types of power that the federal government actually had. We also have state powers, which are sometimes called reserve powers, and then we've got shared powers. Now, remember, in a dual federalist system, there is very little overlap between state and federal authority, between state and federal powers. So you wouldn't have very many shared or concurrent powers in a dual federalist system. But today that's changed with the advent of cooperative federalism and a gradual increase in federal powers, okay? Remember that gradual increase in federal powers. Over time, again, we have seen that the federal government is getting stronger, that its powers have tended to become increasingly expansive, and that more and more they are encroaching into territories which theoretically should be and historically have been handled by the states. This gradual expansion of federal power relative to the power of states is going to be the second major historical trend in the development of American federalism that I want you to be familiar with. But it also raises a question. What has been driving the gradual expansion of federal power? Has there been some relevant change in the Constitution authorizing the federal government to do things like regulate health care or establish mandatory minimum sentences for crimes? Well, no, not really. But there are a couple of factors which do help to explain why states are becoming increasingly marginalized and why the federal government continues to expand in its power and influence. First, we have the emergence of fiscal federalism. Fiscal federalism 
is a system in which taxes raised at one level of government are distributed to and spent by another level of government. Usually what this means is that the federal government gives money that it has raised from national taxes to the states so that the states can use these monies to do things like build roads or fund hospitals. And today, the federal government has more revenue that it can use to help fund the states than ever before because one, our economy has grown, and two, our taxes are a lot higher now than they were at our nation's founding. How does this translate into more influence for the federal government? Well, remember, it means that the states are somewhat dependent on the federal government for financial support. And they're basically like children. They've become accustomed to certain benefits, but do not have the means to provide those benefits for themselves, or at least don't feel confident in their ability to do so. It is the federal government, in this case, which is acting like a stern father. He's willing to help support the habits of the children, the states, but he has certain conditions. In other words, the monies being funneled from the federal government to the states come with strings attached. Think of that example I previously mentioned. There is no federal drinking age in the United States as a whole. Yet we do know that every single state has the same minimum drinking age, 21. But why that particular number? Why not 20 or 22 or for that matter 18 or any other number? Is it simply a matter of coincidence that every single state and Washington DC have all agreed on exactly 21? No, no. The reason that they've all set their minimum drinking age to 21 is fiscal federalism. In exchange for federal grants to build highways, Oklahoma and every other state in the union has agreed to use its police powers to set the drinking age to 21. And that means that the federal government is getting what it wants. It tells them that if, it, if they want that money, they have to comply with its wishes. In this case, they have to set the drinking age to 21. So the first factor helping to drive the federal government's increase in dominance has, again, been the emergence of fiscal federalism. But more importantly, we also have a series of Supreme Court cases going back to McCulloch versus Maryland in 1819. Now, the details of this case are discussed in greater depth by your reading, but what I want you to know is that McCulloch v. Maryland initiates this long-term expansion of federal power by creating what we refer to as implied or inferred powers through its interpretation of the Necessary and Proper Clause in Article I of the Constitution. You can contrast implied or inferred powers with enumerated powers that were originally enjoyed by the federal government. Remember, those enumerated powers are the ones specifically mentioned in the Constitution. And under the 10th Amendment, these should be the only powers of the federal government because the 10th Amendment specifically says that any power which is not explicitly given to the federal government by the Constitution belongs solely to the states or the people. But Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution also includes what we call the Elastic Clause. The proper name of the Elastic Clause is the Necessary and Proper Clause. But we call it the Elastic Clause because it's been twisted and stretched and bent by the federal government through the Supreme Court to help expand its own power. And that's going to start with McCulloch versus Maryland, which essentially says that contrary to the Tenth Amendment, there are some federal powers that are not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, but which can be inferred from what is written in the Constitution. We call these powers, which are not explicitly enumerated or delegated by the Constitution, but which can theoretically be inferred, implied, or inferred powers. And what is the basis for the idea that there are some unlisted federal powers? Again, that's the Necessary and Proper Clause, which tells us that the federal government has the power to, and I quote, make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution, 
the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or office thereof. What this means is that in addition to enumerated powers, the federal government is allowed to do whatever is necessary to exercise those powers. So for example, the ability to create a military is an enumerated power expressly delegated to the federal government by the Constitution. But what's one thing you need to do if you want to raise an army? Well, you need to gather soldiers. And what if you can't find soldiers? Well, the, you might have to draft them, right? So that's what our government does today. And they do so, again, by appealing to the necessary and proper clause. They argue that the draft is necessary for an enumerated power and can therefore be inferred from the Constitution. But this should be ringing some alarm bells because now we've run into something of a constitutional contradiction. Remember, again, that the Tenth Amendment to the United States Constitution explicitly tells us that there are no inferred powers. It says, and again I quote, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. In other words, if it is not a power explicitly given to the federal government, it belongs solely to the states, which again creates that system of dual federalism where we have very little overlap between states and federal authority and where the powers of the federal government are very, very, very limited. They're limited because this amendment tells us that the federal government cannot do anything that it hasn't been explicitly authorized to do by the language that is actually written into the Constitution. But, remember, the Constitution is very vague and brief. It hits on some big issues, but it doesn't do so much to address the bread and butter of day-to-day -day government. That is, by and large, going to be left up to the states. Basically, then, what we find is that the federal government has claimed that it has inferred powers to impose itself into areas of policy constitutionally reserved to the states through the 10th Amendment by appealing to the courts and their interpretation of the Necessary and Proper Clause, which, yes, does seem to say that there are unlisted federal powers. So then, how can we rectify the Tenth Amendment statement that the federal government only has enumerated powers with the Supreme Court's declaration that it also has inferred powers? Well, the short answer is that we can't. The Tenth Amendment and the Elastic Clause in Article 1 both clearly contradict each other in the same way that the Seventeenth Amendment contradicts Article 1, Section 3 of the Constitution by allowing us to popularly elect our senators. Remember how the Constitution was made. It was a negotiated document, a product of controversy and compromise. There were a whole bunch of different people and factions all trying to decide what the government should look like. They were all trying to design a government that was closest to their own ideal. So there was no unified plan or vision for the Constitution. What we got was, again, a product of prolonged negotiations and compromises in which politici uh, politicians competed to undermine and override each other. In this case, we had a battle between the wealthy Federalists who wanted a strong federal government to protect the rich and the less well-to-do Anti-Federalists who wanted a weak federal government but strong local governments to protect the poor. The Federalists were the ones who primarily got their way at the Constitutional Convention while writing the Articles or main body of the Constitution. And they included in this main body of the Constitution the Necessary and Proper Clause, specifically because they wanted a very expansive federal government with immense power. They knew that that language was vague, that it could be twisted and stretched by the courts to help make certain that the federal government was, at the end of the day, able to take virtually whatever power it wanted from the states. 
But the Anti-Federalists were unwilling to ratify the Constitution as written because they knew this. They knew this, and they wanted the federal government's power to be more limited in scope. We had a controversy, and the two factions compromised. In exchange for the Anti-Federalists' agreement to ratify the main body of the Constitution produced at the Constitutional Convention, the Federalists, in turn, agreed to ratify a Bill of Rights amending that Constitution. And very cleverly, the Anti-Federalists included in this Bill of Rights the Tenth Amendment as an attempt to override the Elastic Clause and thereby limit the federal government to its constitutionally delegated powers. Unfortunately for them, the courts have largely decided to ignore the Tenth Amendment and focus instead on the Necessary and Proper Clause. But one way or the other, what we're going to see here is that there are two different categories of power created by the Constitution. First, federal powers, which can now be either enumerated or inferred, and then we have those reserved to the states, uh, the state powers created by the Tenth Amendment. And there is, however, one final category of power that we'll need to discuss before closing out for the week. The final type of power created by our Constitution is going to be the concurrent or shared power. A power in this category is one which is held and exercised simultaneously by both the states and federal government. Some really good examples of these are included on the slide. Let's focus on the first example, taxes. If you've ever held a real 9 to 5 job, you've probably paid taxes. And when you went to file those taxes, you probably had to submit two separate forms, one to your state for state taxes and one to the federal government for federal taxes. That's because under our constitutional system of federalism, both states and the federal government are allowed to tax citizens as a means of raising the revenue needed to operate our governments at these different levels. This then is a concurrent power because both states and the federal government have the authority to levy taxes. And again, that's going to come from the Constitution. Now, it's important to note that under dual federalism, shared powers were very limited. We had taxes, okay, but the Constitution does not say much about how to handle most forms of crime. So under the Tenth Amendment, again, we should expect to see that the federal government is kept out of that domain. Yet in reality, we know that the federal government plays a very big role in making policies that affect things like criminal procedures and sentencing. That's again going to result from the expansion of federal power, starting with the Supreme Court's invention of inferred powers with the case of McCulloch v. Maryland. As federal powers increase and we shift towards cooperative federalism, we see more and more overlap between state and federal power because the federal government's domain is expanding into areas that were previously reserved solely to the states. And so today, this diagram gives us a pretty good breakdown of the different types of powers and how they fit into three respective categories. One last time, I'll remind you that in a system of dual federalism, there would be very little overlap between these two spheres of policy. But today, that shared quadrant of federal and state powers is increasingly large. And indeed, most of the policies we live under today are going to be influenced by both states and federal government entities. In summary, then, remember that the United States is a federal country. We're not the only federal country, by the by. Mexico, Canada, and Germany, and others also have similar systems of federalism. But because we are a federal country, each of us is going to have to live under multiple bodies of laws that sometimes overlap or intersect and sometimes do not. And some of these laws are going to be made by the states using their reserve powers, while others are going to be made by a federal government using its inferred or enumerated powers, and still others are going to be shaped by a pragmatic mixture of the two. And that brings to a close our lecture for this week. Y'all have a nice day.